So I'm here today with Tom Hedrington, who is basically, Hello. Um, I don't know, the legend of hospitality and art in Manchester, I'd say. Possibly overstating uh, it. Uh, overst art and culture, food and drink, Manchester, that's my shtick. The most understated art and culture, yes, hospitality never person. Yes, overstated. There you go. Uh, whereas I, however, am quite the opposite. It's a yin so. yang, it's a balance, it works. It's good. Well, we're going to talk today about um, what's going on with you, what, mm -hmm. what you think is going on in Manchester, and we've come to uh, the fabulous Malmaison, where I think yeah. you've eaten here a few times before, haven't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, very good steaks. I can smell the charcoal in the background. They're obviously warming it up for us, so I'm, uh, I'm hungry. I want to get some action shots. That's what I want of them cooking the of steak. The food, yeah. Of the food, yeah. Nice. It's good. not that okay. sort of movie. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hello. I'm Laura. I'll take care of you this afternoon. Um, this is your a la carte menu. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. I said, I didn't actually realise it was a, 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 a grill here. Yeah, the grill. Yeah, they've made that their big thing for the last couple of years. Since they redid it as smoke, it's all been about the grill. So they were actually one of the first places in town to get a really? hospital in, yeah. And so what, what's the difference between that and, you know, a barbecue or a standard grill for the layman? It's like a barbecue, right. but you couldn't use a barbecue in a, a restaurant in a kitchen because of the smoke. So oh. the idea is it's effectively a charcoal barbecue. You get all the sear and heat and flavour and smoke of a barbecue, but it's in a sealed oven unit. Right. So with the right extraction, you can use it safely in a restaurant kitchen. So it gives you an outdoor cooking style. Inside? Inside. Genius, yeah. so you get Isn't all the it? nice smoky taste. Absolutely. That's oh, good. Idea. Oh, well, I'm definitely going to have to have something off there. Let's start with uh, food and drink there. So I was down at the NRB, did a little vlog. You did? Um, got uh, unusually drunk, actually, by some of your naughty uh, uh, exhibitors there, mm -hmm. playing me with their wares. Unusually. But yeah, it's the biggest yet. We had, um, I think the visitor numbers were up about 11%. Um, so we had very happy exhibitors. Everyone did a lot of business. Right. Um, our strap line for the company is world-class northern events. And that is what we try to do. Just right. because it's for a northern market, we're not parochial, we're not small time. There's no reason that we should be any less ambitious than a show down in London or anywhere else in the world. So yeah. yes, we happen to be there for the northern audience, but we're, um, we're very much aiming to be best in class, to be world-class. I'm actually going to steer away from the steak. I'm cooking. <laughs> I'm cooking steak tonight. I've got hanger steak in tonight, which we're having for tea. It could be a mistake. Fresh pea risotto. That's me done. So I've never been a big risotto fan. Actually, I always think it's a bit baby sticky. Mm, I don't I know. know. No, it texture. I, I like the texture. I like the texture. I like a bit of comfort food. And I've done the 10k now, so I can I can pile on the carbs. You so know, so yeah, to tell me about that. What was your, first of all? What was your time? I'm proud of my time. So I am going to tell you my time. I was 40 minutes and 46 seconds. That's really good. Top 1% out of 40,000 That's really, people. really good. Because like, it would, would the professionals were 32. That's brilliant. I've got dodgy knees. I'm nearly I can 40, imagine. I'm nearly 43. I'm I got exhausted just watching the crowds. Interested to get. Did you run for charity? Yes, I ran um, for Hospitality Action. All oh, right. It's a charity I, I sit on the board of. Um, and it's effectively a benevolent charity for workers in the hospitality industry. So it's there to support them when they fall on hard times. It could be bereavement, it could be illness, it could be addiction or debt problems. But it's there to give them a helping hand and, right. and kind of keep them on a steady path. And you've got two big art fairs that happen each year. Um, the overarching uh, brand for the fair is called Buy Art Fair. Um, and the other element is called the Manchester Contemporary. And together they, they are the largest art fair outside London. Um, and since we started them, I think we've now sold in excess of three million pounds of art wow. to art lovers from all around the north, not just Manchester, all around the north of England. By art fair is, you could say that it's made more accessible art. It's art that's easier to understand. There can be some very, very big names within there, from Liam Spencer to JJ Adams. Um, very collectible works. Some of the works can be quite expensive. So they start literally down to £50, pounds, £100. Pounds. Really? Okay. Um, and then the Manchester Contemporary is, is what's referred to as critically engaged art. It tends to be more challenging works from emerging artists. Quite often the galleries are kind of artist-led gallery spaces. Um, and it can be much more difficult, but it can also be very rewarding if you take you know, the time to kind of get your head around it and really look at it and really consider it. So I suppose by art fair is, is kind of like um, people might know from London the Affordable Art Fair or London Art Fair and then the Manchester Contemporary is maybe more like Sunday or the areas that they have within Freeze 
like frame or the emerge section of right. um, Art 16. So from the art scene in Manchester, as, as you see it, I mean, there's just been a festival this weekend at the northern quarter of street art. It's, it's going on. Yeah, yeah I, on. I gave a speech at the um, at the launch last night. It's right. Cities of Hope. Right. Um, and I've, I've just seen uh, one of the, the artist collectives um, uh, actually painting just on the side of the building on Tariff Street. Uh, they've got a huge thing going up. Uh, it, it, that's an absolutely fantastic festival and uh, the, the talk that I gave last night was really making the links between what we do with the art fair and, and what they do with street art which okay. initially might seem quite separate yeah. one of them you can't own it's on the side of a building indeed, indeed. and the other thing is all about ownership and, and purchasing you know these are the biggest names in the world they travel all over the world and they've come to Manchester Apart from one notable street artist, I assume. Apart from one. Yes. Yes, apart from uh, Mr. Fancy. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's an exceptional thing. How was your starter, by the way? The starter was very nice, actually, yeah. Uh, it's the uh, pork terrine. Did it hit the spot? Oh, was it? It did. Yeah, yeah, you can't beat a little bit of fried food. It's a posh way of doing it, but it's kind of a fritter, really, isn't it? And yeah, I think it. fried food, I, I th I, honestly, I'm a firm believer in um, saturated fats are actually good for you. It's all the way. Stay, stay clear of margarine. Butter, cheese, cream. You know, that's what you want. All the good stuff. Well, there's a, there's, um, there's a famous pheno phenomenon which has been investigated scientifically. It's called the French Paradox. In that they actually eat and drink all the things that Western society tells us are the worst for us. Yet they have very, very low rates of heart disease and right. stroke and all, all the kind of Western diseases that we right. find in the UK, we find in America, etc., etc. And um, they think it's pretty much proof that it's not necessarily saturated fat or cream or butter or animal fat or red meat or red wine or anything which is the issue in America or England. It's probably processed foods right. and, and a lot of the things like hydrogenated fats which are actually causing the problems. Yeah. That's just a huge steak. It is. Right. And a little bit. But if you look at Manchester mm -hmm. and the way it's um, changed and transformed, where do you think the success has come from? People is definitely the main thing, I think. It's people. Um, and it goes all the way back to Tom Bloxham mentioned this because he also gave a talk at the uh, Cities of Hope launch last night. He referenced this. Manchester's Renaissance didn't start with the IRA bomb whatever people may think. It's, again, it's a lovely human story, it's a neat narrative, but it's not true. Um, it started when we had the failed bids for the Olympics. And, you know, there was like 10,000 people in Castlefield uh, Arena there to see the results, and we lost. Uh, you know, and arguably, the, you know, the media were laughing at Manchester and all the rest of it, but Tom feels, and I believe as well, that actually it changed that day, because yes, we lost, fair enough, we lost fair and square, but suddenly Manchester was looking not comparing itself with Bradford or Birmingham or Leeds or wherever, but it was on a stage with, I forget who the other front runners were, but it was people like Los Angeles or you know Sydney or whoever it might be. Suddenly we were, we Global. might have lost, but we were in a battle. We were on a level with these major international cities. And it, it was a changing that frame, changing that reference point as to where Manchester could and should be just really kind of tips everyone's enthusiasm and everyone's ambition for the city. That's true. And I don't think you can underestimate as well um, the leadership of the city. Whichever way you're politically, and however unhealthy you may feel it is that there's very little dissenting political voice within Manchester, you know, we're almost, I think, like 100% Labour now. Yeah. That unity and that kind of uh, pure direction of purpose with Sir Howard, yeah. And, and, and Sir Richard Lee's at the top of the tree. It does give you really strong leadership and a really strong vision and the will and the power to actually deliver that. So everyone's talking about the bubble. Mm -hmm. Is there a bubble in hospitality? Because how can you keep opening 30 to 40 new restaurants a year, all of exceptional standard, as the, when the population isn't growing that much? Now, apart from events okay. and, and booths. So, uh, how's this going to work its way out, Tom? I think it's a fundamentally ridiculous question. And it, I love this. And it drives me up the wall because is there a bubble? Yes. And will there be a bust? Yes. And will there be another boom and another bubble? Yes. And maybe another boom and another bust and another bust and then a boom? Yes. Because that's, economics. That's economics. You know, it's like it's like natural systems. It's economic systems. Everyone all over the world since time immemorial has tried to level it out. It cannot be leveled out. It's not within us, it's not within human nature, it's not within 
uh, the, the kind of world of science and biology and, and populations and economics and all the rest of it, it will never happen. So the one thing I can say categorically is there's a bubble and there'll be a boom and there'll be a bust and then it will all happen over again forever and ever. Amen. So once we've got that out of the way, what's happening in Manchester? I think fundamentally for me, we, we've seen the huge boom. We, you know, we've grown our restaurant scene has grown faster than London, significantly faster than London over the last uh, the last ten years. We've we've done a couple of reports and studies. We've worked with a couple of organisations, CGA Peach, who are an industry data organisation and a, a, a consultancy called the Russell Partnership, and our restaurant density the number of uh, people per restaurant is now almost catching up with London. I think it's down to about 11, 12, 1300 people per restaurant or something like that in Manchester. It's getting to almost lower levels. So we have had um, a boom, and to use the, the word again, it's unprecedented. But it's a fallacy when people say to me, how many more restaurants can we all eat? Because it's not about us. To think it's about people in Manchester is absolutely wrong. If you took London and said, okay, Take everyone out of London except Londoners. <laughs> How many restaurants would there be there? There'd still be a very good restaurant scene, but what would it be? 25% of what it is now? I went to London last week, I'm going to London this Thursday. I'll probably eat out across those two occasions on four or five occasions. I'm not from London, I am a tourist. I'm a business tourist, but I'm a tourist. London is propped up by tourism. And you could argue that so is New York, you could argue that so is the Lake District. If tourists didn't go to the Lake District and people from Cumbria ate and drank there, they'd be like, you know, two wet pubs instead of a plethora of wonderful Michelin star restaurants and all the rest of it. So Manchester is a little bit obsessed, I think, with how much Mancunians can eat and drink. And what they're missing is a dynamic where we've gone from having literally no tourism to now quite sizable tourism, with the big, second biggest overnight destination uh, for international visitors in the UK. Well, actually, we're narrowly the third after London and Edinburgh, but we're catching up fast. Okay. We've got more hotel rooms than Birmingham, we've got more hotel rooms than Edinburgh. We've had the fastest growth of hotel rooms. We've got the biggest hotel pipeline in the world in percentage terms. We've almost doubled the number of hotel rooms in a decade, yet our occupancy rates and the rates that the hoteliers can charge are going up. So that's not oversupply, that's undersupply. No. And it, it's these tourists, it's these people who are coming to Manchester, and this reference goes back to your earlier point about what Manchester represents. People who are coming for the music, the culture, the food and drink, the business, the major events, Manchester Central, the arena, you know, media city, spinning fields, all these things which are pulling people in. They're all coming and staying in hotels, and hotel rooms don't have kitchens. And when you go to a city, <laughs> you want to eat out more, not less. You don't normally go to a hotel to have a club sandwich and skulk in your room. No. If you go to a city, you want to go out and see the city. So people in, who are travelling to Manchester eat out disproportionately more than your average Mancunian who's got a home to go to at night. And it's this which is driving the city, and it's this that's driving midweek dining, and it's this that's driving the growth of restaurants. And I'm not for one minute saying that it's la la land and it's all going to be wonderful forever because it's not we will have peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs there'll be continual corrections and there will be some casualties but no one no one can say that that underlying line of the restaurant industry that Manchester can sustain is not going up and will not continue to continue to go up and it's tourists that are the biggest part of it I would say at the minute unlike London the local market is more important than tourists but if you ask me where the growth is coming from, it's mostly tourism. That is where the growth is coming from. The city centre population is growing from 500 people to 25, 30,000. It is growing all the time. There's still a cultural trend that people in the UK are following the American model of eating out more. I, think, I forget the exact stats, but I think Americans eat out on average seven or eight times a week. The average in the UK for out of home eating is still about three, three and a bit and we tend to follow American cultural trends. So we're continuing to eat out more. Mm -hmm. In America, everyone eats out for breakfast. That's not happened to us yet, but maybe that's gonna be a growth area as well. So I think the cultural trends mean more restaurants. The population growth specific to Manchester means more restaurants. The city center population growth means more restaurants. The additional business, industry, offices, companies moving to the city means more restaurants. And the big one, more tourism means more restaurants. So peaks and troughs, High points, low points, closures, openings, definitely, but the underlying trend for me is just up, up, up. Tom, what can I say? That is um, 
that's inspirational. I'd like to do is, um, I'd like to thank you for coming for lunch. What did you think of uh, your main course? It was fantastic. It was, uh, it was lovely. It was, it was a risotto, pea risotto, a little bit of basil oil on there as well. And it, it was lovely. You know, we're, we're here at the tail end of spring, getting into summer, and it pretty much nails the season. It was light, it was fresh. Very, very good indeed. I enjoyed it. I'm, I, I now feel completely ridiculous in the fact that I just had a massive piece of meat. You went caveman. That you went full of caveman. It was pretty bloody good, actually. Well, it's your inner Neanderthal. I, I would like to get a bit more details on the art show. How do I... Where, is there a website or something? The website, yep, it's live at the minute. If you go to Buy Art Fair, B-U-Y Art Fair, all one word, .co.uk. God bless you, Nick. Cheers, Lovely my friend. Lunch. Cheers, Thank man. You. Cheers, man.